The Grey King by Susan Cooper. One, The Golden Harp. Grey Fox. Nobody else could feel it. Will knew. As far as outward appearances went, there was no reason why anyone should feel the least unease. The skies were a gentle light blue. The sun shone with unseasonable warmth so that Reese sat up on the tractor bareback as he plowed the last stubby fields, singing a clear tenor over the roar of the machine. The earth smelled clean. Yarrow and ragwort started, starred the hedgerows white and yellow with the red berries of the hawthorn thick above them. The sweeping slopes where the valley began to rise were golden brown with bracken, dry as tinder in this strange Indian summer sun. Hazy on the horizon all around, the mountains lay like sleeping animals, their muted colors changing with every hour of the day from brown to green to purple and softly back again. Yet behind all this autumnal gentleness, as he roamed the fields and the gorse-starred mountains, Will could feel tension mounting everywhere, advancing like a slow, relentless flood from the high peaks, brooding over the end of the valley. Emnity was beginning to push at him, slowly but irresistibly. The pressure of malevolence was building up to the point where it could break and overwhelm him, and nobody else knew. Only the hidden senses of an old one could feel the working of the dark. Aunt Jen was delighted with the change in Will's appearance. Look at you, only a few days, but you have color in your cheeks now. If this sun goes on, you will be getting brown. I was writing to Alice last night. I said you wouldn't know him. He looks like a different boy. Very nice, son, indeed, Will's Uncle David said. But a little too much for this time of year, thank you. The pastures are getting dry, and the bracken on the mountain. We could do with a bit of rain now. Hark at you, Matt Jen said, laughing. <laughs> rain is one thing we are never short of here. But still, the sunny skies smiled, and Will went off with John Rollins and his dogs to fetch a flock of yearling sheep that had been wintered at Clude Farm, that was to be wintered at Clude Farm. The hill farmer who owned them had already driven them down halfway to another farm at the head of the valley. As he looked at the milling off-white chaos of woolly backs bobbing and shoving, eighty or so lusty young ewes bleeding and buying an ear thling chorus, Will could not imagine how they could possibly be brought intact to Clued. When one sheep broke away from the rest and pranced sideways toward him, where he stood in the field, he could not persuade it back to its fellows even by yelling and pushing and whacking its broad woolly sides. Bah! said the sheep in a deep, stupid baritone, as if it had not been there, as if he had not been there, and it wandered off and began chewing at the hedge. Yet the instant Tip, John Rowland's sheepdog, trotted purposely in its direction, the sheep turned dutifully round and bobbed back to the rest. Will could not see how John Rowland communicated with his dogs. There were two, the dappled Tip, named for the splashes of white on his muzzle, at the very end of his, wag of, his waving, of his waving tail, and a bigger, more formidable-looking dog called Pen, with a black long-haired coat and a crooked ear, torn in some fight long ago. Rollins needed them. Rollins needed to do more, to do no more than look at them, a smile creasing his lean brown face. With a soft word in Welsh or a quick whistle, they would be off in some complicated maneuver that the average man could have understood only ten minutes, only after ten minutes of detailed explanation. Walk in the front, he called to Will through the deep, unnerving chaos of bahs as he opened the gate and the sheep poured through into the road like milk. Will forward to wave at any cars coming and stop them at the side. Will blinked in alarm. But how do I keep the sheep back? They'll all run past me. John Rowland's grin flashed white in the dark Welsh face. Don't worry, Penn will see to them. And so Penn did. It was as if he had a rope tied around the front of the herd of sheep to keep it in a neat tight curve, trotting, darting, slinking on his belly, moving always forward, sometimes perusing an errant sheep in the right direction with a curt single bark. He kept them all moving obediently along the road, and Will, clutching the stick John Rowland had given him, strode ahead, bursting with confident pride, feeling as if he had been a real shepherd since time began. They met only two cars, in fact, all the way down the valley road, but directing even those to pull to the side to pull in beside the hedge was enough pleasure. 
with the sheep crowding in with the sheep crowding by in a rippling gray flood. Will was enjoying his job so much that perhaps he thought afterwards he let his deep his deeper watchfulness falter, for when the attack came he had no sense of warning at all. They were on a lonely part of the road with barren moorland on one side of the road and dark tree clad mountainside rising at the, rising at the other. No fields were cultivated here. Bracken and rocks fringed the roadside as if it were a track over an open mountain. Suddenly, Will became aware of a change in the sound of the sheep behind him, a higher note of alarm in their bleeding, a flurry of scurrying hooves. He thought at first that it must be John Rowland and Tip heading off a runaway, but then he heard a sharp, piercing whistle, and in that moment had Penn swinging round at the sheep, growling, barking, threatening them to a standstill, and he heard John Rowland calling, Will! Quick, Will! He ran back, skirting the frightened, bleeding sheep, then jerked to a halt. Halfway past the flock at the edge of the road, there was a great slash of red. There was a great splash of red at the throat of a single tottering animal, smaller than the rest. Will saw a flicker of movement in the bracken as some unseen creature fled. Away it went toward the mountain, and the fronds waved, and then were still. Will watched horrified as the wounded sheep staggered sideways and fell, its fellows pushed away from it, terrified. The dogs growled and threatened, frantically containing the herd, and Will heard John Rollins yelling and the thwacking of his stick against the hard road. He too yelled and waved his arms at the heaving flock of sheep, keeping them together as they tried in a panic to break away over the moor, and gradually the nervous animals calmed and were still. John Rollins was bending over the injured ewe. Will shouted across the heaving backs, "'Is it all right?' Not much hurt, Mr. Vane, we're lucky. Rollins bent down, heaved the inert sheep over his shoulders, and grasped its fore and hind feet separately, so that it hung across the back of his neck like a like a huge muffler. Grunting with effort, he slowly stood up. His neck and cheek were smeared red by the sheep's blood-stained fleece. Will came toward him. Was it a dog? Rollins could not move his head because of the sheep, but his bright eyes swiveled quickly round. Did you see a dog? No. Are you sure? I saw something running away through the bracken, but I couldn't tell what it was. I thought it must be a dog. I mean, what else could it have been? Rollins did not answer. He waved him ahead and whistled to the dogs. The flock began pouring on down the road. He walked at the side of it now, leaving the rear entirely to tip. Neatly and, effort and efficiently, the dog, let the dog kept the sheep moving along. Soon they came to a deserted cottage set back from the road, stone-walled, slate-roofed, sturdy-looking, but with glass broken in its two small windows. John Rollins kicked open the heavy wooden door, staggering inside, and came out without the sheep, breathing heavily and wiping his face on his sleeve. He closed the door. "'Be safe there until we can get back to her,' he called to Will. "'Not far now.' Before long they were at Clude. Will opened the gate, of the broad pasture where he knew the sheep were to be kept, and the dogs nudged and nagged them inside. For a few moments the sheep eddied about, bleeding and muttering. Then they settled down to a greedy, rasping nibble of the lush grass. John Rollins fetched a land rover and took Will with him to collect the injured sheep. At the last moment, the black dog Pen leaped up into the car and settled down between Will's feet. Will rubbed his silky ears. "'It must have been a dog attacked that sheep, surely?' he said as they drove. Roland sighed. I hope not, but indeed, I cannot think of any wild creature that would attack a flock with men and dogs alongside. Nothing but a wolf would do that, and there have been no wolves in Wales for two hundred years or more. They drew up outside the cottage. Rollins turned the car so that its back would be an easy reach, so that its back door would be an easy reach, and went into the little stone building. He was out again, almost at once empty-handed, looking uneasily about him. She's gone. Gone? There must be some sign. Pen. Tell ya. John Rollins went casting about, around outside the cottage, peering intently at grass and bracken and gorse, and the black dog wove its way round and about him, nose down. Will, too, peered hopelessly, looking for flattened plants or signs of wool or blood. He saw nothing. A jagged rock of white quartz glittered before them in the sunshine. A, woodland sh a woodlark sang. Then, all at once, Penn gave one short, sharp bark 
and was off on a scent, trotting confidently head down through the grass. They followed, but Will was puzzled, and he could see some bafflement on John Rowland's seem seemed face, for the dog was tracking through untouched grass, not a stem bent by the passing, even of a small creature, let alone a sheep. There was the sound of water running somewhere ahead of them, and soon they came to a small stream flowing down toward the river, the jutting rocks in its course showing how much lower than usual it was running in the dry spell. And we'll pause there. <clears throat> 